All right, welcome to week two of the quarter. And this week we will be considering uh, the New Testament letters, interpreting the epistles of the New Testament. Uh, 35% of the New Testament is comprised of epistles. So that's a significant chunk of Scripture, uh, certainly. And, of course, uh, some of the most read most preached portions of the Bible are the New Testament letters. So an incredibly important part of Scripture. Uh, and uh, on your class site there, you have a chart of those letters. You see that the majority of them have been written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, we do not know who wrote the book of Hebrews. There's a lot of ongoing speculation over the years, whether it was uh, Paul or Luke, or Apollos, um, but we, we don't know for sure. Uh, the book of James, written by the Lord's half-brother, James. Uh, Peter, the apostle, wrote two letters. Uh, the apostle John wrote three letters. And then the other, another half-brother of the Lord, uh, Jude, I recently preached through that little letter, and uh, it's a really neglected book of the Bible, but an important one. So there you have the epistles of the New Testament. Uh, how do they compare to other ancient letters? Um, as they uh, as they compare um, to other letters of the time period, informal letters were a routine part of everyday life and were meant to be read only by the person to whom they were addressed. Now that's informal letters in the ancient world. Uh, formal letters were artistic, literary letters designed for public presentation. And, of course, that's exactly what we find uh, with these letters. They also served as authoritative substitutes for personal presence, meaning, uh, obviously, the, the apostles and their associates could not be everywhere at the same time. They were not... Uh, omnipresent. They are not God the Holy Spirit. Uh, physically, they were limited and bound by space and time. Uh, but their letters could be written and sent and copied and spread. And so in their absence, the apostles could write letters that could then be a, a blessing and speak authoritatively as the uh, commissioned representatives of Jesus uh, in the in the letters to the churches in uh, in a city or a region, letters provided a way <clears throat> for early Christian leaders to express their views and minister from a distance. Uh, we notice, for example, in Galatians one one, Paul refers to himself as an apostle, uh, which means uh, one who is sent, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. Who raised him from the dead, or Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. So the, the letters were written by an apostle or a close associate of an apostle, like James or Jude. Now, the some of the characteristics, let's talk about, of uh, New Testament epistles. Uh, they were situational, meaning that they were written often to address specific problems or situations related to the author or to the readers. And, and this is exactly what we find um, throughout the, the epistles of the New Testament. Um, they have an occasion. They have a setting and a, a historical context as the reason for their composition. And it's really important when you are preparing to study and teach or preach through an epistle that you do a good, thorough uh, background study of the historical, cultural context of the letter. You need to know the uh, something about the author, the audience or the recipients, the location, the reason for its being written or purposes. Uh, you know the date. Uh, something. What do we know about the the church? Uh, you know, for example, when I preached through Philippians, 
um, one of my first messages in the book um, was actually from the book of Acts, chapter 16. Why? Because that's where we find the founding or planting of the church in Philippi. So there is a, a an inspired historical context to that church. And, and of course, you can find that type of context with many of the churches in the New Testament. Uh, Thessalonica, for example, um, or Ephesus. You know, we have information in the history book of the New Testament, the book of Acts, about some of these locations. And you see there that the, the city of Philippi was uh, in Macedonia. It was an important church because it was the first church on European soil. So that's important. And then you find out that they uh, it's a good church. It brought Paul a lot of joy. It's the letter of joy. But it did have some problems. They had some um, some some doctrinal problems, uh, teaching or attacks from uh, Judaizers, it would seem, but also some some uh, conflict in the church with some women in the church that are mentioned in the fourth chapter. And of course, uh, you see that the church was founded there in Acts 16 with Lydia and possibly the Philippian, Philippian jailer and his family. Um, so it's important to understand you know, what's going on as best we can and to recreate that context for ourselves and our readers and our listeners. Um, you know, when you read 1 Corinthians, Paul will often address questions that the Corinthians had for him. He'll say, you know, you wrote to me about this, and so let me address that. So the, the, the problems, the sins, the, uh, the conflicts and the struggles of the New Testament churches are reflected in these letters because they're situational. And, you know, sometimes people say, oh, I wish we could go back to the early church and to the, you know, sort of like they, we think of the first century of the church as the glory days. And if we could just go back and be a, you know, a New Testament church. Well, friends, New Testament churches were churches with problems, churches with sinners, churches with conflict. Uh, so, you know, which New Testament church do you want to be? Corinth? Uh, they had problems. Ephesus, there were problems. Colossae, there were, it was heresy in Colossae. Um, Philippi, there's conflict. So those letters would be of no relevance to us if they did not have a historical situation that, frankly, is relevant and uh, to us today. And that's exactly what we find. So... Um, Fee and Stewart, I think this is from their book, uh, you know, Making the Most of the Bible uh, or something like that's the title. Uh, they say this, uh, one will go to the epistles again and again for Christian theology. They are loaded with it, but one must always keep in mind that they were not primarily written to expound Christian theology. It is always theology applied to or directed to a particular need. So they were situational. Number two, they were carefully written and delivered. Uh, the task of actually writing down the letter was normally given to a trained scribe known as an amanuensis. So an amanuensis is the fancy word for a, a trained scribe. So I sometimes jokingly ask people, hey, who wrote the letter to the Romans? And people will inevitably say, well, Paul did. And I'll say, no, actually Tertius wrote Romans. Why? Because we find in the last chapter of Romans 16, verse 22, I, Tertius, wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. So Tertius was Paul's amanuensis, who would have uh, written, in this case, the letter. Um, but Paul, of course, was there involved in the whole process. Um, in 1 Corinthians 16 and Colossians 4, uh, Paul mentions at the end of those letters, I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand to let you know that he wrote the greeting himself. <clears throat> so they were carefully written and delivered. Paul used co-senders to assist him in the drafting, editing, and rewriting of letters. Uh, also, there at the end of Romans, uh, Romans 16, I believe, indicates that uh, while Tertius was the amanuensis, Phoebe who was a servant of the church, 
uh, was the one who apparently delivered the letter to the Romans. So Paul used co-senders to assist him in this process. And he uh, also used trusted friends like Phoebe and uh, I think Tychicus is mentioned uh, maybe at the end of Colossians as the one who delivered. And then there's Epaphras who I think delivered the, the um, maybe Epaphras delivered uh, the letter to Colossae. But either way, there were other people involved in the composition and delivery. Now, number three, third characteristic of New Testament epistles, they were intended for Christian community. Uh, New Testament letters were intended to be read out loud in community. You know, take, for example, Ephesians uh, in chapter 5, where Paul addresses uh, married couples. And then he mentions children, and he says directly to children, children, obey your parents. Uh, where were the children when that letter was read? They would have been in the assembly with their parents, and they would have heard the letter of Ephesians read out loud to them. So why were they read out loud? Well, number one, remember, this is the first century. They don't have the printing press. Letters were too valuable to loan to individuals, too, too precious. Uh, you couldn't, you didn't, you didn't want to lose a New Testament letter. Jewish Christians, those in churches that were, uh, you know, converted uh, Jews, were accustomed to hearing the scriptures read aloud in synagogue. So this is something they were familiar with doing. Um, and then, of course, some Christians were illiterate. They could not read, so they would be read to them. Now, the form Let's talk about the form of New Testament letters. You, you have an introduction in the letters where the author provides his name, uh, the name of the recipients, and then a greeting and some type of like invocation or introductory prayer. Take Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, overseers being the pastors, plural. There were uh, plural pastors, multiple pastors, and multiple deacons in the church in Philippi. Now, the purpose of the introductory prayer or invocation, uh, one was to express gratitude for all that God had done in the life of that particular church. And the uh, prayer also introduced important themes that will be later or developed later in the letter or as the letter unfolds. So in many ways, um, the, those first verses of a letter, don't neglect those. Do not read over those too quickly and don't fail to teach them. Remember, all scripture is inspired, even the greetings, the introductions, and the benedictions and the genealogies. All scripture is inspired and profitable for doctrine, for teaching, for reproof and correction, that the man of God may be uh, thoroughly equipped for every good work and trained in righteousness. So um, I often use the introductory verses of a letter uh, when preaching verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, to do a, an introductory message to the book and talk about a, who was Paul? Uh, who were the Philippians? What do we know about the church in Philippi? And just let that first message basically set up uh, the background information to the rest of the study. The second major part of a letter or epistle is the body. And this is the largest portion, of course. Um, there is no set format for this portion of the letter. Uh, as it addresses the specific needs of each church. So the body looks a little different depending on the letter, its length and the situation and occasion uh, and, and what the uh, author is wanting to address. The, the final major portion, of course, is a conclusion. And there are numerous elements that can occur at this point in the letter. The most common element is the grace benediction. Uh, benediction is a spoken blessing uh, in the... Um, to the to the congregation. So let's now transition to how to interpret New Testament letters. 
And here we're going to take the interpretive journey. Step one, grasp the text in their town. What is that going to, what's that going to look like with a letter? Well, one, read the entire letter in one sitting. Man, I cannot commend that to you enough. Um, do that as much as you can with any book of the Bible. Read it in, in, in as much as you can in one sitting and do the 30,000 foot overview, like a plane flying across the landscape. Look down and just see the whole landscape at one time before you then parachute down and come into the forest and look at the trees. Look at the whole thing. You know, it's like looking at a parade from beginning to end. You know, if you're up in the sky, you'd see the whole parade in one shot. But then if you're on the ground, you're going to watch the parade as it passes by. So before you come down on the ground, go up and look at it from above and understand the whole and or the general before you dive down and look at the individual or the specific. Reconstruct the historical context. Again, go back and, and see what did, what, what is recorded about this church, this city, elsewhere in Scripture, especially in the book of Acts. Let me just mention a couple of important resources here. Um, one would be, let's see, an introduction to the New Testament. I'll just... I've got several New Testament surveys and Old Testament surveys on my shelf. One I want to just point out here is uh, an introduction to the New Testament, Carson, Moo, and Morris. Morris has died, so the, the new edition of this is just Carson and Moo. Two of my favorite scholars, D.A. Carson and Doug Moo. Anything you find by those, these two guys, you need to snatch up. So in this new New Testament introduction, you're going to have a, a background study on every book of the Bible. Um, and it's going to answer those questions about who and where and what and when and how and why. So you want to really know that well because those individual texts that you study are going to be in light of the whole uh, context. Uh, a lot of those uh, letters will give a purpose statement. Like 1 John, I think it's like 1 John 5.13 uh, John says, I've written this to you who believe or to believers that you might know that you have eternal life. So it's a book about assurance of salvation to believers who already uh, claim to be Christians, but they want assurance that they're saved. Now, when you reconstruct the historical context, you've got a list of questions uh, like, who was the author? What was his background? When did he write? What was the nature of his ministry? What kind of relationship did he have with the audience? Uh, why was he writing and who was the biblical audience? You have to know those things if you're going to understand the, the letter. Uh, what were their circumstances or the occasion? What was their relationship with God? What about their relationship to the author and each other? Uh, what was happening at the time the book was written? Are there any historical cultural factors that might shed light on the book? You know, I think about 1 Peter. It's a letter written to address the problem of persecution. So hostility uh, against the church from the world, from the outside. Pressure from the outside is the historical context. So if you understand that it's a book written to Christians suffering for the faith under the Roman government, then it'll help you understand each individual verse and text that it's written and it has something to do with that overall purpose of, of persecution and suffering. Whereas 2 Peter, okay, 1 Peter is about persecution. 2 Peter is about apostasy. That is those who uh, abandon the faith, who walk away uh, from the truth. And so it's, it's about hostility and opposition from within the church. False teaching, heresy, false teachers. So... First Peter, opposition from outside coming against the church. Second Peter, uh, hostility from inside the church uh, coming on the outs to the outside. So in step one of the interpretive journey, you're going to reconstruct 
the historical context, identify the literary context. In this case, it would be, you know, epistle or letter. Read the text carefully and notice in, in exclamation points, observe. Those of you who were with me last quarter, you'll understand how important observation is to hermeneutics. Step two, measure the width of the river to cross. Okay, now, generally speaking, the width of the river with the letters is, is narrow. It's not, you know, wide like the Mississippi, like an Old Testament book typically will be. Because the letters of the New Testament and the situations uh, are often very, very familiar to us. The, the, the cultural, historical, um, you know, um, even linguistic differences are not as wide. So that's a good thing. It makes some, some things easier. But you need to acknowledge what is different. You know, like for, in 1 Peter 1, Peter says in some of our translations, the, the literal reading at the end of uh, chapter 1 is, you know, gird up the loins of your mind. It's sometimes translated prepare your minds for action rather than gird up your loins. Why? Well, because in the 21st century, a lot of people don't know uh, what it means to gird up loins because <laughs> we don't typically wear uh, robes and have a belt around that robe where we tuck up the the the, the uh, robe so that we can work or or fight um, and our legs are, are free to move that's the idea is you know he says gird up the loins of your mind so in other words there's a, a little bit of a a, a, a a, a cultural difference. We don't know what girding up loins are. You want to help your reader understand that figure of speech in the 21st century. That's the kind of step two uh, river that you need to cross. Uh, step three, cross the principalizing bridge. Uh, does the author state a principle? Does the broader context reveal a theological principle? Why was a particular command or instruction given? Okay, and then I would say, add to this, how is that principle rooted and grounded in the unchanging nature and character of God and which one of God's attributes is, being, uh, on, is on display or being referred to in the text? Some texts are very obvious. Um, you know, like when Peter says, uh, and he quotes the Old Testament and says, be holy because I am holy. God says we are to be holy. Well, obviously it's going to be a text and probably the verses around that are going to be about what holiness looks like uh, in the life of a Christian. Uh, step four, consult the biblical map. Make sure the principle you formulate doesn't contradict the clear teaching found elsewhere in Scripture. So you're going to look at elsewhere, other places in the Bible that speak to that principle in step three. Now, let me encourage you, when you do your assignments, on step four, in part, I'm looking for verse references, chapter and verse, uh, book, chapter, verse references that show me where you've consulted the biblical map and where your Step three can be confirmed in other places in the Bible. And then step five, grasp the text in our town. This is the final step of application. So remember the three steps to applying a theological principle from chapter 13. You might want to go back to chapter 13 and review that uh, and those steps to uh, applying the text today. But friends, if you understand the text then and there and you have you have followed the journey, and you've not cut corners, uh, then by the time you get to this step, you should be able to recreate a, a contemporary example or scenario that reflects the main principle and idea of how the, the author and the original audience understood the text. And to recreate that in a situation today where your people in your context can apply the same principle and it look a little different than it did today. All right, so um, 
your your textbook will take you, walk you through the interpretive journey, I believe, with Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, to give you an example of how to do the interpretive journey with a text from an epistle. So re please review that carefully. Read that and pay attention to what is done, how it's done, and then practice it with your uh, assignment this week. All right. I think that's all for now. I uh, hope you're doing well and I hope you enjoy this assignment and as we launch into practicing hermeneutics with uh, New Testament letters. And then next week we'll be looking at New Testament uh, Gospels. God bless you.